Hey, it's Mark Podolsky, The Land Geek, with your favorite niche real estate website, www.thelandgeek.com. And I'm really excited for today's guest. Unfortunately, Scott Todd is not going to be with us today, but our guest today is really kind of cool and edgy. Imagine if Grant Cardone had a sales child that was more ambitious than him, right? That is my guest today. Ryan Stuman is a 4X best-selling author. He contributes to Forbes, Entrepreneur, Addicted to Success, Good Men Project, Lighter Side of Real Estate, and Huffington Post. He's got more Salesman of the Month plaques than he can count. And he is the owner of Hardcore Closer, which is an online learning resource for salespeople. Ryan Stuman, CEO of Hardcore Closer. How are you? I'm awesome, Mark. I really appreciate you having me on here. I'm, I'm excited to, uh, to hang out with you for the next 30 minutes or so. So, Ryan, how does, how'd you start in sales? What do you like about sales? Like, let's give, give us your superhero story. Well, I, I've, I've never had a salary job my entire life. So I've never had like a paid vacation or a paid day off or any of that. Every job that I've ever had since I've ever started getting a job was a commission job. Now, I started selling when I was 13 years old. Uh, I'm selling car washes, working for my stepfather. And so some, some weekends we would sell, and, and I worked there for eight years. So some weekends on a Saturday, we might wash a thousand cars, which gave me an opportunity to to talk to a thousand people and try to pitch them on, you know, they want a $5 wash and maybe I tried to sell them a $7 wash or something of that nature. Right. And, and so it gave me the opportunity to put like, you know, by the time I was 20, I had been working, you know, anywhere from 10 to 40 hours a week inside of this car wash where sometimes we were pitching a thousand people a day. So it's pretty easy to like get prolific at being a salesperson because I got to take so many turns face to face. And uh, during that period of time, and one of the customers at the car wash offered me a job in mortgages back in 2003. And she was like, you worked really, really hard. I see you working here for years. I don't know why in the world you work here at this car wash. Come work for me. I'll make you a millionaire. And she did. I went to work for her and she's passed away now, but I went to work for her in uh, 2003. And by the time 2005 had rolled around, I'd already made a million dollars in the business and uh, owned a bunch of real estate and stuff. And, and, uh, and I have been in sales basically my entire life. So... Uh, I did the, the whole mortgage and real estate thing until 2010. And, uh, and then I started this online training platform, which was, which was rough at first, to be honest with you, because people didn't believe in Facebook the way they do now. People didn't believe, like funnels weren't a thing back then. We had to upload websites. And uh, so it's, it's been a, a rocky road, but now with like everything's starting to find its stride. The technology's picking up to where we needed it to be and, and things are really good over here. That's, that's an amazing story. I mean, you know, to, to get into sales and have that many reps and to be able to talk to that many people, uh, I would imagine that at some point you'd hit a slump or you would, uh, you know, maybe get burnt out. How did you keep going on those days where, you know, you might be talking to a thousand people, but maybe the first 20 say, no, 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 no. Ryan, you're annoying me. No. Right. How did you, how'd you get to the 21st person and be like, okay, go into the $10 upsell. And then for mortgages from there, same kind of thing, very competitive, right? Um, how, do you, how do you deal with it mentally? Well, so that, that's a good question. Like on the car wash stuff, <clears throat> from what I remember, on rainy days, nobody bought anything. So like say you had spilled some soda in your car, so you needed your car washed. Or you had like, you know, your kid or dog hair or whatever. So you needed your car wash, but it was kind of cloudy outside. So you didn't want to spend a lot of money because you know rain's coming sooner or later, probably as soon as you wash your car, right? Murphy's Law. And so you're not really wanting to spend any money. And so I used to just make it a game, you know, I, and I would just play with them and get them to laughing and everything else. And, and if they bought it, fine. If they didn't, but I always just... Uh, I wanted to entertain myself more than them. I wanted to make an experience where people come in and I don't ever want to be somewhere where I don't like my job. You know, even at washing cars, I, the reason why the lady offered me jobs because I like my job. I was going to be the best damn car wash person on the planet at one point in my life and I was going to own the place. That was my, my deal. I was going to work all the way up and own the place. And, you know, I just, and, and I always made it like a fun experience. Sometimes I'm kind of a, I can be kind of a dick, you know, sometimes I would make people mad in the vacuum and then see if I could make them really happy in the front. Right? Like, so it's like, just, I just always played like little games with myself. It's like, sir, you can't park there, move your car immediately. And then the front's like, 
oh man, is there anything I can do for your car? Can I get your tires? Or like, I just like, I, I don't know. I always like doing things like that, but that was kind of, I kept myself always, I kept, I kept myself on the toes all the time so that I didn't get burned out, I guess you would say. I kept it entertaining yeah. so I wouldn't get burned. Yeah, I mean, there, there's, there's definitely an, an authenticity to you that um, kind of comes through right away, right? Um, even when you go on the website, like hardcorecloser.com, there's an edge, right? Um, how did you develop that naturally? And how does that differentiate you from other sales trainers like, you know, like a Grant Cardone or a Tom Hopkins um, or some of these other guys? And th- yeah. Those dudes are great. You know, they're great too. They're a different generation than I am. Uh, <clears throat> I'm right there on the border. Like you could call me a millennial or you could call me a, a Gen Z or whatever the, the person before the Gen Y maybe it is. What it doesn't matter. But like if you wanted to put a label on me, it's born in 79. So I'm like literally right there on the border. So uh, I kind of been able to uh, serve both the people that are a little bit older that didn't grow up with iPads and technology and stuff the way that like my kids have had an iPad since birth pretty much, right? They're going to grow up way more technically advantaged. The, the people that are 10 years old right now, they're going to grow up with technology that we never even hear about in our lifetime, right? So or we never even grasp. And so the reason why I say that is those guys are great, but what I do is different. It's on the tech side and we teach sales. Like most people these days don't answer their phone. Uh, they'd rather communicate via email. They'd rather you talk to you via text message. They, they'll shoot a quick video for you, and then, but they don't want to talk to you. They'll shoot a quick Snapchat, but don't you dare call them. And so I'm teaching like this, the future of sales, right? 92% of all phone calls go unanswered. And so I'm teaching people how to use other ways to get people to contact them. For example, like we talked about funnels earlier. And so that was my variation in where, how I got my edge and what makes me different is the technology component that I bring to it. But how I got like the hardcore closer edge is I, I've lived like a really rough life. I was adopted at age seven. I was on the streets by the time and I, I left school in the ninth grade. So I never finished any other grade, but the eighth grade, I was on the streets about the time I was 14. I worked at different car washes uh, around the little area that we're in probably all of them from one time to another. Cause I couldn't get my sh- shit together and not, you know, make it late to work or whatever the case may be. Uh, by the age of 19, I'm selling drugs and in jail. And uh, by the time that I was 21, I was out of jail and back working at the car wash again. And then I obviously got into the mortgage business, end up getting in trouble again, going back to jail again. And, uh, <clears throat> and just like on a technicality, but long story short, I've had like this really rough all the way up to I was about 25 years old. I went through like literally every, about everything in hell you could think of here on this planet. And, and having to go through all that, it just kind of made me you know, A, I don't hide it. And, and so that kind of, that's where you get the authenticity vibe from it. But B, it's given me this hardcore edge. It's like, you know, what do I have that these other guys don't have? Is I've had to sell for my life in prison to keep from getting stabbed. I've had to sell the, why, the, the prison guards and why I wasn't involved in the riot and didn't get thrown down. I've had to sell car washes. I've had to sell pretty much everything. And it's just, the, the, the marketplace started calling me the hardcore closer. I didn't just step up and say that that was my name. That was just like this nickname that the marketplace gave me. And I was like, that's kind of cool. I'll just go with that because they could give me something that's terrible and then I'm going to be stuck with that. So I'm going to go with the hardcore closer deal. But that's how that, that came about. It's because the rough upbringing and then, then, you know, several of my friends started calling me the closer and then like somehow they started the, the whole hardcore closer thing and we just ran with it. Wow. I mean, that, that's a really dramatic story, Ryan. Um, and all in like five minutes too, right? Try yeah, to just like yeah. nonchalantly fly that under the radar there for you, buddy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, so I mean, essentially you were selling for your life. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So when you come from that kind of background, everything else kind of seems a little easier perhaps or no? It doesn't yeah, ever get easier. I, I say this often, you know, it's like if you think I'm scared of creditors or a business going bad or losing my house or not being able to drive a Maserati or, or having to give a, a truck back or something like that, dude, like it's still nothing compares to going to prison. So any risk I take out here legally, I know the consequences can't be worse than what I've already suffered through and come out the other side. So basically that leaves me fearless and ruthless because I'm not worried. I always say if all this stuff goes out the window tomorrow, I'll go sell roofs or I go back to, you know, going and selling real estate. Like I have sales abilities that'll always be there for me, but I'm not scared to take risks. You know, I invest way more in my business and pay myself way less than a lot of people in my position that earn the income that we do uh, would take, but it's for a reason. I'm always risking it because I'm trying to grow more. So I'm not scared of losing it either. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, Tim Ferriss talks about uh, fear setting and being able to 
uh, you know, there's goal setting is really important, but fear setting, being able to walk through your worst fears and then kind of realize, well, it's not that bad, right? Like you've kind of done that in a way. You were actually even lived it. And so you have that sort of internal confidence to go out in the world and be like, well, nothing can really be that bad because I've already done it all. In that, in that, in like I've, I've, I've lived through some of the worst things that a human being can go through, right? So if, you know, if someone's having a bad day and they take it out on me, well, I'm fine, right? But Ryan, so when you're training somebody who hasn't gone through the things that you've gone through, let's, for lack of a better word, let's just call them soft, right? How do you, how do you help them transition mentally to taking sort of, you know, a typical salesperson's um, rejection, right? And keep going on in the face of rejection. Well, that's, that's a good question too. You know, first, I don't, uh, I've never had a family with, with money or anything like that so that I had a security blanket. And so sales has been the one thing that I could always rely on. That's where my confidence comes from is that if something happened here, I could just go sell something else, right? And that, I think that a lot of good salespeople are that way. And when it comes to people, the, and, and this is another differentiating factor for me and, and every other salesperson that trains or teaches out there is the folks that come to me are the hardcore people. They're like the, the, the people like you just mentioned, someone that let's say soft, right? There's some, someone that's made wise decisions their entire life and, and didn't do a bunch of dumbass stuff when they were younger, right? Let's just say that person. We're not doubting them. <laughs> we're just saying they made wiser decisions. Those are great. Those guys, they go to Brian Tracy, wears a suit and a tie, and he, you know, he goes to church on Sunday, or maybe they go to Cardone. He's a suit and tie guy. Goes to the, you know his church deal, whatever he worships on Sunday. You've got those guys out there. However, I've been in real sales jobs like Brian and Grant. They haven't worked a frontline sales job in forever, right? Like they haven't gone to work and sold cars in the last three decades. I was selling cars in 2011. You know, they haven't written a real estate deal like firsthand in a long time. And I'm not knocking them. I'm just saying they sell sales training now. That's not their thing anymore, right? And so they're selling themselves. Whereas it wasn't that long ago that I was selling this stuff. And I realized that, you know, the sales place is full of misfits, for lack of a better word. Because if, if, if you're in sales, chances are you didn't grow up with like a silver spoon and get like Ivy League educated. That guy's usually the CFO or CMO or some C-level weird title or the general manager or something with like a fancy degree or whatever. The sales force is generally people trying to cut their chops and get into the company. People that are really good with, that are comfortable with commission only. And they're usually people that are, that are transient, right? They're just like me. If all this goes out the window, I'll go somewhere else. That's usually how salespeople are. A lot of them have tattoos. Very few of them go to church on Sundays. A lot of them have one addiction or another, whether it be sex or, or drugs or rock and roll or whatever the case. And I'm not saying anything bad about the community that people don't already know. Every time they make a movie about us, it's sex, drugs, and rock and roll. I mean, look, the Wolf of Wall Street or Boiler Room or anything like that. Even Tommy Boy, you know, they're all partying and doing drugs on there too. So the thing is, like, that's, that's the demographic that I reach because of my background those are the people that reach out to me. I get messages every day. It's like, man, I, I you know, I made $500,000 last year. And when I was 19, I was arrested for selling crack. Like nobody has any idea. I mean, it's nice to see you and be able to get this off my chest. Hey, do you think you could help me grow my banking business? Cause it's like, dude, just because somebody's a banker and a millionaire now doesn't mean that they didn't come from a rough past like I did. It's just that they, a lot of people in their licensing bureaus and the public spotlight, so they can't talk about it but I'm that guy that they can talk about it and they can keep it real. So when I say, you know what, that's some bullshit excuses that you're giving me, man, you know that things can get worse than that. Get out there, make the calls, get out there, create the funnels, run the ad, whatever has to be done. They can take it from me as experienced, someone who truly does understand where they're coming from and how their ego works and stuff like that. And someone that's overcome this stuff that they can look up to basically and follow in my footsteps. Yeah, I love it. I love it. So let's get a little, uh, into the nitty gritty of, uh, of sales. Right. And, you know, let's say that, uh, you know, I, I call you and I see your ad for a piece of raw land and I, I want to buy it. Right. Um, walk me through the kind of questions you would ask me and then, you know, how you would handle like the objection of, Oh, okay. I really like it, Ryan, but I'm going to talk to my wife. Perfect. Let's do it. Let's, why don't, why don't we do this? Why don't you be, the guy calling about the land, I'll be the land owner. We'll just say that you saw an ad online or in a newspaper or whatever, but, you're, but I'm calling you in regards to that. Would that work for you? Sure. We'll do a little, sure. little role play here, Mark. A little role play. 
I love right, it. So. Hey, hey, Mark, it's, it's Ryan Suman over here at thelandgeek.com. I got your information uh, from the internet that you're looking to buy a piece of land. Is that correct? That's right. That's right. I saw your ad on uh, Craigslist there, Ryan. Uh, awesome, awesome. Well, well, what made you decide to reach out? Well, you know, I used to travel in that area, and uh, I'm a trucker, and I drive over there all the time, and I thought, man, it'd be great to own 40 acres in Nevada, and so I saw that ad, and I thought I'd click on it and get some more information about it. Gotcha. You ever, you ever owned a piece of property before? No, no. The only, only real estate I've ever owned is, is my house. Gotcha. So you've been dreaming about owning a piece of land for a while, probably. It's like a, it's like a man thing, right? It, it is kind of a man thing. You're right. Yeah. You hunt? It's the desert. They got big scorpion hunting over there. You know? I do hunt. Yeah, absolutely. Love me some scorpions. Um, <clears throat> and so you said Nevada, I couldn't resist. So, um, so you've been dreaming about this land. You do hunt. That's awesome, man. So if you were to get your hands on a piece of land like this, which we've got some amazing prices, like you're not even going to believe uh, what we can probably do for you. But if you were to get your hands on something like this, what, what would your plans for it? What would you do with it? You know, I want to go out there, maybe hunt, fish, camp, just use it recreationally. You know, one day take my kids out there. Just, you know, 40 acres is a lot of land out there. So um, probably just that, honestly. No, not a house. You're not going to build like your dream home out there. No, there's like no that. utilities out there. It's not ready. You're a trucker. You don't want to build a parking lot, nothing like that. National, no, no. National park. All right. All right. And so you've been dreaming about having some land and you really just want as a place to go hunt and hold on to, like maybe as an investment or something to, like leave a legacy for your family, like a place to sink some yeah, money into. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Gotcha. Gotcha. Well, awesome. Well, here's what we do. Our, our acreage is uh, some of the, the lowest price acreage at all in Nevada. Here's the reason why it's that way. It's because we get it directly from the government. In case you didn't know, the government owns 89% of the entire state of Nevada. And we steal that shit from them, just like they steal taxes from us. That's why we get it so cheap. So the thing is, if you're going to take 40 acres, it's probably going to be somewhere around a half a million dollars once you break it all down. I don't even know what the price is, but imagine it's about yeah, a half a million dollars. Our prices are like, are like a thousand acre because it's okay, like cool. really, yeah, really rural. So we'll say 40,000. We'll just keep it realistic then. Yeah. We'll say, uh, the price is going to be somewhere around thirty-five to $40,000 and then you're going to have some taxes and stuff like that. Have you ever uh, applied for financing from a bank or anything like that? Yeah, right. We owner finance, so you'd finance it. Okay, so, uh, okay, cool. So uh, you're looking to get finance or pay cash? Uh, yeah, I mean, I can, I can finance it. Uh, 40,000 is too much for me to pay cash. Okay. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, listen, we're getting close to the, to, to making your dreams come true here. Uh, we do owner financing, which means that you can put a small amount of money down and make monthly payments and treat this property as if it's yours. We don't enter the property. We don't go out there. We don't manage it, maintain it. We're, we become essentially the bank. You, you send the check off to us. We're the landlord. Then when the principal is paid off, of the land, which you can pay off early at any time. There's no prepayment penalty or anything like that. You can pay off early at any time. So if you get, if you haul a load of cocaine from Tijuana to California and you make an extra hundred thousand dollars, you can pay this off with no uh, fees or interest. And uh, we'll even help you hide the, the money from the IRS. If you need to, we can sell you some more land. Uh, so if that's something that you're interested in, if you really commit, it sounds like you've been thinking about this for a long time. Uh, despite what your credit is, as long as you can come up with probably $2,500, maybe $5,000 down, we can get you into this land, get it financed. You can own and you can be hunting here in the next 30 days. Yeah, right. Let, you know what? This sounds really great. Let me talk to my wife and, uh, and can I call you back? Yeah, absolutely. Let, let, before you leave though, I've been doing this for a while. And uh, I know that that's like one of the first things you wouldn't want to go make a, a commitment on something without talking to a, 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 your wife. In this case, sometimes it's a business partner in this business, but here's what I, I do want to uh, discuss with you. you. You're doing this for yourself. You know, you said that you want to hunt and at no point, and you said you want to bring your kids out there to hunt at no point you really mention your spouse. And the reason why I say this is uh, she's not going to be into it most likely as much as you are, because this is something you want to do for yourself. It's like, if you wanted a $40,000 Rolex, like you're going to be all excited about it and you're going to think it makes you feel amazing, but your significant other, there's, there's no significant value for them. So I just want you to understand that if this is something you've been dreaming of, and this is something you want, I can hundred percent help you. Now, I, I'm not going to tell you not to go talk to your wife. I'm not going to be that sales guy. But what I am saying is you need to go into that conversation. And, and if you really do want this property, 
and this is what you want to do and we can make that happen for you. And if you really do want that, you've got to go into this conversation thinking about how you can convince her that this is what's going to make you happy and she wants to be a part of that versus going in there and expecting her to just be like, oh, that's a great idea, honey. I just want you to be happy because that's not how relationships work. You've been married for a while. I would imagine you know that. Oh my gosh, 20 years, man. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So you're going to have to, if this is what you want, and I'll help you if that's the case, but you need to make that decision on if this is what you want, then you're going to have to go in there and sell your wife, not tell your wife. That's just how it is. All right, so uh, I'll, I'll go sell her. Um, well, what's going to happen next is I'm going to follow up with you in 48 hours. Okay, this property has uh, not been on the market very long. And as you know, when we offer owner financing and, and the ability for basically anyone to get their hands on deals like this as we get them from uh, the government land grab, then they go quickly. And so, listen, when I asked you the first few questions, you said basically that it was your dream to own a piece of, piece of property out there. I'd like to help you make your dream come true, but I also know that you need to go and handle your stuff at home. So I'm gonna put just enough pressure on you to get you to make that decision. So in 48 hours, you need to have spoken with your wife. And when I call you back, whether the decision is yes or no, we just need to make sure that we have a decision so that we know what we're getting into. Does that sound fair, Mark? That's fair. Perfect, perfect. I'll be in touch with you on Thursday at 1 p.m. Uh, Nevada time. All right, so Ryan, that was great. So let, let's break down exactly what you did there. Well, first notice I never said, like price was never an issue. You never said, but it's too expensive, right? Um, right. Notice the other thing is I made it about not the piece of land because he doesn't want a piece of land. He wants a place to get the fuck away, right? He wants a place to get like, I, like you thinking about this, you're saying get away and hunt stuff like we're hunting in the desert, right? This is a person that wants to get away from the city and needs a place to connect to the land and relax and stuff like that. So I start, how long have you been wanting to do this? Has it been your dream and start showing them the bigger picture that this thing that they've been thinking about for a long time can 100% come true for them through the methods that we have. But what I also was pre-framing at the end for you to do was to make a decision. I don't care if your decision's no, that's okay too. Every no, that's fine. I know that you don't want it and I can quit following up with you and I can go on and find somebody who does, but I need you to make a decision and I set those expectations up front. So in two days when I call him, he should have spoke with his wife and the, and the prospect should have also made a decision. Maybe the wife said no and maybe the decision no, that's okay, but that stops our sales cycle or we moving forward making progress on getting the property in his name. Right, right. Now, how often, like, let's, let's assume like you and I just don't connect, like, I'm a, I'm a church going guy and you're cursing. Um, how often would that turn people off? Uh, you know, that's not something that I, I get a little comfortable on these podcasts, I guess, but on, on sales conversations. And so I have a real estate business and we flip houses and I, right. I would never, you know what I mean? I'd never drop F-bombs on the, on the deal. And it's, it's really my job <clears throat> in the beginning. We're, we're kind of rushed here for for time during our conversation, but in my job, I would have really extracted more from you. You know, you got a wife, you got kids, you got, you know, I would have had a little bit more small talk. So I'm extracting facts from you. It seems like small talk to you, but really I'm getting a sense of who you are. You know, like maybe it's like, you got a wife and kids. Oh, you go to church around here somewhere. Nah, we don't go to church. Then I, you know what I'm saying? Like I'm right, asking right, right, these right. kind of questions. Right, right. <clears throat> but it. it's crazy. We have like five clients right now in our mastermind that are preachers. So like you, they, they like me because I'm honest. I asked them too. It's like, how in the world did you wind up here in this deal with me? They're like, dude, we, you seem like the only dude we can really trust. Cause you're just giving it straight as it is. So I, yeah, I love it. I love it. But That's, you know, yeah. man, my sales approach uh, is, is always been like, I'm your older brother. It's like, Hey man, put my arm around and tell you how to fix this situation you're in. That's how I've always presented myself. And I think that that makes me feel like come off as like a coach or authentic. Some people use or whatever, but really what it is, I just want to like, I'm a friendly guy. I just want to make it to be like, Hey man, how can I really help you out today? Right. Sometimes you make money from it. Sometimes you don't. Oftentimes you make money from it. Sometimes you don't, but it's still worth the effort, you know? Right. Right. But you know, let, let's say that I'm just a more analytical personality. I'm not, I'm not real uh, I'm kind of shy, right? Um, how do I, how do I transition and, and learn to be more comfortable talking to people when I don't have the reps you have? I haven't talked to a thousand people on a Saturday. This might be the third person I've ever talked to ever on, about a sales thing. And I'm, and I'm nervous about asking for money. How do I get over that? First, you should never be nervous about asking for money as long as you're asking for the right amount and you're exchanging the value for it. But um, 
here's what you need to do. We call this the ultimate objection handling exercise. You can find stuff like this and tons more things over at hardcorecloser.com. Uh, anything you want to know in sales is on hardcorecloser.com. That thing is a plethora of information, 715 blog posts as of uh, this recording right here. So um, the reason why I say that is there's something called the ultimate objection handling exercise. And on that, what you're going to do is you're going to write down all the objections that you expect to get. Uh, price, time, spouse, need to talk to my partner, not ready yet bad timing, can't get financing, whatever all that you know, like even if this is the third person you talk to, <clears throat> you still can sit down and make a conscious list of all the things that would come up that would make somebody not want to buy that or an excuse for them not to move forward with that piece of property. And once you list all of them out, then you need to list them. Number one is the most important, the most frequent, the most the, the most likely to come up in a conversation. And then the last number is the one that you may never hear from, but it still might be out there, right? Number them all in between, number of importance, right? One being the most important, most frequent. Next to each one of them, you need to write down the rebuttal. So if they say, I need to talk to my wife, you need to say about what, right? If they say, I need more time, what are you gonna do with it, right? Whatever those rebuttals are that you're writing down and then memorize this stuff so that you're confident in yourself and you know what could come up and what the chances of coming up and what you're gonna say if it comes up. Then you also need to take six questions. That's it, we call them our six magic questions. And like for real estate with us, it's like, what areas are you looking in? What time frame are you looking to make the move in? What price range are you looking to buy in? Do you need to sell the home that you're in right now? Are you represented by a real estate agent and are you pre-approved from a bank? Those are our six magic questions. With those six questions, we get a basic outline of everything we need to know about the prospect within a matter of minutes of asking those, right? So you, as an investor, you need to have all the objections and your six magic questions ready. Then even if you suck and you stammer at sales, you're still informed and you still have the stuff in front of you to draw the people out. Maybe that person's analytical or maybe you're analytical, but especially if this works really well if you're analytical, because then you could just follow the, the bouncing ball that you've written in front of your, your stuff here. But if they're analytical or whatever, you're just walking them through a process. And, mo and they don't know the process. It's not like somebody's calling you that's bought hundreds of plots of land and they know all the things that you don't know and they've done all the research in the world. The likelihood of that happening is like slim to none. What's really gonna happen is they expect you to grab their hand and walk them through this process. And that's what those six magic questions and the pre-framed objections uh, will do for you. All right, fantastic. Well, Ryan, we're at that point now where I'm going to put you on the spot. It went so fast. It just I went know. so fast. Maybe we're having I such know. a good time. It, it, I, we'll have to come back. And I'm going to ask I'm you for your right tip of the week, a website, a resource, a book, something actionable where the Art of Passive Income listeners can go right now, improve their businesses, improve their lives. Your mentorship has been amazing, this podcast. But I'm going to ask you for one more piece of information. What do you got? Yeah, head over to elevatortothetop.com, elevatortothetop.com, and uh, you can get a free copy of my paperback book. That thing sold, I don't know, 25, 30,000 uh, copies at this point. We've sold a whole lot of them, and uh, you can get it for free over there. You just pay the shipping cost, and then there's a couple other offers that you can take me up on as well, but just head over to elevatortothetop.com. That is the like sales playbook. It tells you everything you need to know from day one to retirement, what to do with your money, how not to get you know, screwed over by corporations uh, in, as far as your structured commission. And if you're self-employed, it teaches you how to set up the employees and the people that you're going to bring on board with you. So you're going to love the book. Just go to elevatortothetop.com. Elevatortothetop.com. We'll have a link to it. My tip of the week is learn more about the hardcore closer, Ryan Stuman at of course, aptly named, hardcorecloser.com. Ryan, was there, was there any questions I should have asked you that I didn't ask you? Well, I got you've a done, question You've done for this you. a while. You've done this a while. Yeah. You're a I pro. got a question for you. Okay. So is that a desk with the treadmill that you're on? Like, ladies okay, and gentlemen, if you're just listening to this, he's been on a treadmill the whole time. It's this amazing thing, right? It's, it's trekdesk.com. So if you go there, it's a desk, and then underneath it is a treadmill. Nice, nice. So yeah. You get to work and exercise. It's you, my friend, live dangerously. I like it. You see, look, sitting's a new smoking, Ryan. Get, get right. up. Right, that's it, that's it. And I hey. think better when, I'm, when I walk and talk. Me too. When I'm on sales calls, I pace. So it makes sense. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, I think it's weird for the guests to see me like kind of rocking back and forth, but <laughs> you, you, you've, been, you've been good about it. You've been good about it. So are we good? That's it, man. I really appreciate you having me on, Mark. Thank you again. It was uh, good times.
Well, thank you. And listen, I want to tell all the listeners the only way, the only way we're going to get the quality of guests like Orion Stuman to come on this podcast is if you do us three little favors, you got to subscribe, you got to rate, and you got to review the podcast. Send us a screenshot of your review to support at thelandgeek.com. We're going to send you for free the $97 Passive Income Launch Kit. Uh, I want to thank Ryan Stuman again, hardcorecloser.com for keeping it real. And uh, I want to thank all the listeners. Let freedom ring. See everybody next time.